Okay, so the bunch of things. So I guess the project proposals are due today. Okay, so I guess whoever has put them up, I sent comments on their project proposals. If you didn't put them up, you didn't get any comments. Um, and then um, uh, the homework, if you would like to do that, it's due today. Right? Isn't that what I said? I think it was what? It's 8. Oh, then it's not due today. Good, good for you. I'll, okay. Whatever I said. 8 is what? Friday. 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 So you're all going to come to my home and give it to me or something? <laughs> so you can just give it to me on Monday. I'll be fine. Okay. Um, so I don't know why I said 8. I don't know what if I said it. So okay. So you can give it to me on Monday. Um, and then, um, then what else? The, there's a mini project that people, if they want to do, that is you, when, October 22nd. 22nd. Okay, that's good. Okay, and, and the project proposals, you know, if you don't have any idea, it's important that you come and talk to me, because if you don't have any project to do, then, you know, we need to figure out what it is that you want to do. Okay. Um, I, there was, I think only two people actually read the FFH paper, um, but hopefully, uh, so those those two will pass the course. The, <laughs> you know, so the others will take this again next time. Um, <laughs> and uh, since I only teach it once in several years, it's going to be good for you. Uh, but uh, actually, you know, the, that paper FF Hub as well as another paper LRTTP, which we'll be discussing today, um, you will wind up reading. And uh, next Monday's class would be just discussion of those papers. Okay, but I would hope that you would have the reviews by then, definitely. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so this, so today, what I'm going to do actually is sort of set the stage for understanding um, the two reading papers. Actually, of which I think the Goth paper, I might change my mind. I think I might actually. I mean, you could read that. You don't necessarily have to write a review on that. FF Hub, you need to write a review, and. Um, LRTDP, you should read it because I'm going to discuss it today and it will be a useful paper to understand. Okay. Uh, okay. So, this is the summary of uh, what we have done on the classical mass rotation processes um, until now. And, uh, and, uh, uh, so you have finite horizon MDPs for which uh, you essentially compute the value functions uh, V0 to Vt where T is the horizon and V1 is computed in terms of V0, V0 is just the immediate reward and uh, and so it's just you use the you know, dynamic programming to compute V1 in terms of V0, V2 in terms of V1 and so on. Um, and then any, at any particular point the policy for k stages to go is just the greedy policy with respect to the value function. The greedy policy with respect to a given value function essentially picks that action which has the maximum expected utility from that state. So of all the actions that you can do, which is the one that's going to give you uh, maximum expected utility, where uh, uh, the utility uh, of an action is defined in terms of the utility or the value of the states it takes you to. Okay. Uh, in the context of finite horizon MDPs, the uh, the value that you can get in VK depends on the value function in VK minus one. Okay, um, that's the that's the policy. Uh, that's the computation of value and policy functions for the finite horizon. For infinite horizon, um, we notice that uh, th this one actually is a non-stationary policy in the sense the action that you have to that you should do in a given state depends on how many steps you have to live right uh, this on the other hand in the infinite horizon case it's a stationary policy because it doesn't make any sense uh, after you do an action you still have infinite amount of time to live so you should not care about how much time you have left to live um, and in the case of infinite horizon, the theory is more interesting because, in a sense, you need to um, the value iteration has to basically you're saying that there is a, a unique value function for the MDP, and uh, and that if you start from any arbitrary value function and keep doing the Bellman updates, 
you would essentially come to that unique value function, the least term, okay, optimal value function. And uh, the, the theory of as to why that will get to the optimal value function, especially in the context, and, and again, for the infinite horizon MDPs, you need the discount factor, which has to be less than one. And if, the, if you have a discount factor less than one, then by the contraction property of the Bellman operator, you are guaranteed to converge to V star. Okay, one interesting thing is that you can also, um, instead of doing value iteration, you can also do policy iteration for uh, um, infinite horizon MDPs. For finite horizon MDPs, it doesn't make too much sense to do policy iteration. Um, so it's so much more, it's much more uh, intuitive here that you start with a policy, convert it into a value, and then once you get the value, then do a greedy policy with respect to that value. And, and so you're sort of making bootstrapping yourself, okay? And so that's the things that we talked about. We also mentioned infinite, indefinite horizon MDPs and of, 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 uh, an important class of that, um, important example of that is stochastic shortest path MDP, where you don't take any discount, but there are uh, terminal states and a policy is considered a proper policy if it with 1.0 probability will get you to a terminal state. Okay, and then you would be interested in finding the optimal proper policy for the um, indefinite horizon MDPs. And in the context of stochastic shortest path, you normally also expect to be told what your initial state is, which is not normally given for a normal, you know, a general MDP. And because you're given an initial state, so this is like the closest to classical planning. You have an initial state, your uh, terminal states are the goal states and you're trying to find out a policy that will get you to the goal state with the lowest expected cost okay um, among all the policies you can have so you want to come up with an optimal policy that will give you uh, the expected cost to the goal should be the lowest among all the policies and so we are actually going to spend a little bit more time on this um, and then talk about how can we improve these classical ideas of especially the um, yeah, especially the value and policy iteration um, once now that you have a notion of initial state and what kind of ideas can you do to speed up the MDP uh, optimal policy construction. And the reason that's important is that the optimal, both these algorithms are essentially polynomial in the number of states and which is kind of bad because polynomial in the number of states means exponential in the number of state descriptors and and so that's going to be bad okay um, so we're going to spend starting today we're going to spend today's class and also next class we'll think about what can you do to improve the speed up of MDPs I can only touch just a, a few points in in that large spec large frontier of research that's going on currently um, in, in that direction um, but I just will give you some ideas as to what are the, you know, what are the most um, fertile directions you know, for improving the speed of, of policy construction. Okay, um, so the ideas for efficient algorithms for MDPs can be approximately split into three pieces. Um, one is, uh, especially since we are talking about SSSP, I mean stochastic shortest path style MDPs, you can start thinking about heuristic search okay so one interesting thing actually is even though you never thought you would uh, believe that a star search is a great algorithm a star search is a great algorithm compared to mdps because in a star search you normally are able to find if you are given good heuristics you are able to find optimal solution without actually having to exhaust the entire space Okay, whereas in the case of MDP, you have to look at the entire space of states anyway because you're supposed to know what to do in every state. So the question is, can we use some ideas from heuristic search to improve um, the convergence uh, and of the MDP policy value and policy iteration of the things? And in fact, thinking about that also makes you realize that in fact there are very interesting connections between for example the value function or the j star function of the stochastic uh, shortest path algorithm and the h star which is the perfect heuristic for any particular in, in the a star 
scenarios. Okay, so when you compute it, J star, you are essentially computing perfect heuristic for a problem. Okay, and if you put on your A star search hats, if I give you a problem and somehow you are able to compute the perfect heuristic for that problem, I gave you initial state and the final state, you computed the perfect heuristic for that problem. If you computed the perfect heuristic for that problem, then in a sense you have also solved the the optimal path from going from start to the goal state. Actually, in fact, what you would be doing, what you would be doing is exactly um, what greedy policy would do. So think about this. Um, suppose I have a start, start state here in some graph. This is deterministic search for now. There's a start state here in some graph, and here is the goal state. Okay, and I'm trying to find the optimal path. I and you know, you know that A star search finds the optimal path. But suppose instead of using A star search directly, I actually went ahead and found H star first. H star will tell you for any arbitrary node in this space the optimal cost to go from there to the goal state. Exact perfect cost. Okay, so then if I know that, then what can I do? How do I find out what is the optimal path? So here I'm here, here I am, and uh, I can basically uh, consider all the actions I can do and all the states that I can reach. So under the start state, I can let's say do action this, this, and this. These are all the states I could reach. They are deterministic, so it's only each action goes to exactly one state. Okay, now I have a this is cost of action A1, this is cost of action A2, this is cost of action A3, this is cost of action A4. That's what I used to get up there. What I need to know is which direction to go. <laughs> okay. Clearly what matters is, you know, if I were to go here, how far I need to travel to go to G. But that's nothing but H star of this state. Okay, so then if I add up C to H star, I'll get F. Okay, and then I just pick the child which has the highest, I mean the lowest F star value. Lowest F star value, and then do that action. Okay, so in some sense I converted my H star into my optimal policy. In the context of deterministic plans, in, in the context of deterministic search, optimal policy will be a line policy because you know, you know, you start from here, you go to this state, and from there you go to the next state, from there you go to the next state until you get to the full state. Okay, so what we did here is very similar to when if you have an, um, a value function converting it into policy. That's exactly what we were talking about last time. So, and now in A star, unless you've been repeatedly dropped on your head, you will never actually compute H star to actually solve one problem. It's a dumb idea, right? Because computing H star makes sense only, only. When does H computing H star make sense, by the way? Yes? When you have to solve um, like many problems in the same space? Not same space. What matters actually for H star is same goal state. So the start states can be all over the space, but the goal state has to be the same. So if you wind up solving 10 million A star searches in this space, you know, where in every search this is the goal state, or whatever, the same set of states are the goal states. Since H star only depends on what the goal states are, you compute it and you keep it, then when you get a new start state, you just basically compute the piece, piece of the policy that you need just from there. Because in some sense, if you know H star, even though I started from start state, I actually know the entire policy. Because if I were in this state, I am to ask myself, if I were to start from this state, what action should I be doing? Well, I know exactly what are the three actions I can, I mean, what are the K actions I can do, what are the states, what are the H star values, and so I would say based on that, okay, this must be the action for this state. Yes, yes. If H star is a good idea, goal state is always fixed and somewhat independent of your start states, mm -hmm. is it used in conformant planning? Is it used in conformant planning? Um, no, in fact, uh, let's see. 
Let me let me table the answer to that question because it, you know I think it, without going, making too much of a digression, I can't answer it correctly. Okay. Um, so, so so in this particular case, essentially you have multiple different goal states. If you have multiple different goal states, you do each star. Okay, fine. Now, why do we then compute each star for MDPs? In essence, that's what I said we are going to do, right? I mean, so if you remember last class, we gave we gave a definition of stochastic star test for MDP, where the whole idea is to compute J star, because once you compute J star, then you know the optimal policy. And why do you need to compute J, you know J star for just because it became stochastic MDP, as again a deterministic MDP? Yes. Could end up in any state, and you want the maximum. Overall. Exactly. So the point is, in the case of deterministic, if I do this action, I know I will be here. If it is stochastic, then it is possible that when I do a particular action from a state, I can go to either this state or this state with different probabilities. And if I do an action from this state, I can go to any of these three states with different probabilities. Now that basically means, in the worst case, just trying to stick to one optimal what means trying to stick to your policy might make you get into all sorts of the you know all sorts of corners of the cell space that's the worst case but it doesn't have to happen either okay for example there could actually be even in an mdp there could be uh, parts of the state space that are disjoint from each other just because you i have just because i have um, you know, shaky hands, which is what basically having a stochastic action is supposed to mean, right? Just because I have a shaky hand, so if I'm trying to put this pen here, you know, it may stand, it may fall, right? But whatever I do, the pen doesn't suddenly go stand on top of the a mountain. A mountain is part of this place, but it still doesn't stand on part of a mountain. Part of a mountain. So there are parts because of these walls. If I close the doors, there is a parts of this space which are actually disjointed. They're basically disconnected from each other. Okay, in that worst case, you know that computing J star is a dumb idea because if I'm stuck in this room, I'll never get out of this room. So my I only need to know what do I need to do in various states of this room. In a more general scenario, just because you have probabilistic actions doesn't mean that entire state space is actually relevant. Okay. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, for example, if you can keep, in particular, if you, for example, are looking for a value function within epsilon of the optimal value function, let's say, which is a normal thing to do because you don't necessarily look for the optimal value function, uh, then sometimes, essentially, there could be, um, so, so there could be stochastic actions in a world and yet you are able to make sure that the uncertainty of those actions is controlled enough that the possibility that you go on to these other sets of states is extremely low, in which case you don't really need to find out what the value function there is. Or even if you do find out what the value function there is, you would rather first find out the value function for the more likely states first, and then less likely states later. So for both of those reasons, essentially, you want to use some of these heuristic search directedness. You want to bring it into MDPs. So in some sense, MDPs, the full MDP model is a much more pessimistic model about the world. Because first of all, a full MDP model doesn't even know where you're going to start from. All start states are equally good. And it assumes that the reward model is general. You can get rewards in different, different states. It's not just end. Okay. Um, but in the full MDP model, in fact, value and policy iteration are the right algorithms. But if you are doing special cases of MDPs, which oftentimes you wind up doing, for example, you know the start state, and for example, you don't have generalized reward function, then you should be able to do better. Okay, and, and the point of most of these discussions, today's class and next class, is it's not the case that MDP, the full general MDP model is here, planning model is here, and that's the only thing in the spectrum. In fact, there is every point in the spectrum, there are problems. And so, if directionality helps, making algorithms that can actually exploit the directionality is a very useful. That's basically what we're going to try and do. So, 
So this is what it's saying, value on policy iteration approaches, use dynamic programming updates, set the value of the state in terms of the maximum expected value or the minimum expected cost achievable by doing the actions from that state. They do the update for every state in the state space, every state in the state space. Because they don't really know which states you would ask the value, the, the policy for. Okay. Whereas heuristic search explores only part of the state space that is actually reachable from the initial state. In particular, in deterministic A star search, you know, for example, that for something like a, you know, 15 puzzle or 8 puzzle problem, the entire state space is split into two disjoint graphs. Such that if you ever actually change, you know, if, if you, for example, uh, swap the position of the beginning position of two tiles, just physically remove them and swap them then you now have gone from one original space to a different space which you can never reach back again just by moving the black around. Okay, And in the A star search, if the start state is in that space, it will never touch a state in this other space, in this other partition. Okay, um, So you, it has that advantage of directionality and it also does that for even in fact, even if in fact the space is not completely disjoint partitions, it still will try to avoid looking at, it will only try, it will try to do only a portion of the space that is needed to prove the optimality of the current path and move on. It's true that in the worst case you can set up A star search problems where it has to exhaust the entire space before it can prove that what it has on hand is optimal. But it's also true that it can do much better sometimes. Whereas these will never do any better. These will always do work which is polynomially connected to the number of states. Okay. Um, so even within the reachable space, heuristic search can avoid visiting many of the states depending on the quality of the heuristic used. If I give you a nice heuristic to begin with, you can start not, I mean, you can avoid touching most of the irrelevant states. But of course, one question is, how can I write a value on policy iteration algorithms in in such a way that they are directional and secondly what is a good heuristic okay and interestingly there is an idea that we have already discussed um, called uh, asynchronous value iteration remember value iteration doesn't have to be synchronous it doesn't have to just change all the states update all the states values for, to the next iteration then update them to the third iteration and so on you can update any state's um, value, uh, you know, much more often than any other state's value. Okay, and so, so there were these ideas of asynchronous and asynchronous um, value iteration and prioritized sweeping. Okay, the question, of course, is how do you decide which states to give priorities to? That's what the heuristic could tell you. Okay, and. Uh, there are many algorithms that essentially use these ideas. Uh, two very important ones actually are real-time dynamic programming and uh, LAO star search, of which I'll just talk about real-time dynamic programming. Okay, um, and in, I will basically send you the link to that paper. You should look at it because we'll be discussing it here, and you should also read it. And if you have questions next time, you should ask me. Uh, we could discuss that again. Okay, so in terms of the heuristic itself, if you are talking about a stochastic shortest path algorithm, then J star is H star. And so a good heuristic is any admissible heuristic. And in particular, in fact, you can actually show things such as if the heuristic is consistent, remember there was this definition of monotonicity and consistency of heuristics. Okay, a consistent heuristic actually follows the triangle law of inequality which it doesn't have to because we just made it out of thin air, right? And so if it does follow a triangle of inequality and it's a lower bound, then it's called a consistent heuristic. And it ha then if you use such a heuristic in A star, you have this what's called the monotonicity property where in essence the F values of the nodes you expand will monotonically increase. Okay, so you will never expand a, F value, a node whose F value is 15 and then after that expand another node whose F value is 7 and then again you know, expand another node which is the X value is 25. You see what I am saying? Okay, and because of which in fact if that monotonicity holds 
those of you who remember the A star pictures, you know, A star kind of starts with the start state, and the breakfast search starts with the start state, looks at circles of equal G values until it will find one of the circles has the goal itself. A star search with a good heuristic will start with the S and look at uh, directed contours. such that, you know, until the contour reaches the, the, the goal state, okay? And the, 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 the better the heuristic, the more directed the contour. And if the heuristic is monotonic, then you will actually, you can actually be sure that if you have expanded a node on this contour, next you will only expand nodes on this contour are the ones above it, not below it. Okay, and it turns out that you can use all those properties in the context of stochastic shortest path MDPs. And uh, in particular, actually, I mean, I will say this in a minute, but you'll also read it in the book that if you were to start with uh, a lower bound monotonic approximation to J star, remember in the value iteration, you are supposed to initialize the values, right? So the J values. We, we had no great idea. We said anything can, you can initialize to anything, which is kind of true. In, in A star search, you can set H equal to zero for every node. It'll just become red for search. But if you happen to know how to get a good heuristic, which we do know, because we spent like first seven or eight classes figuring out relaxation heuristics for planning, right? And if you happen to know that, then we should be able to use those kinds of heuristics to set the initial value function. And if the value function initialization is probably a lower bound, and if it is a consistent uh, value function, then you can show that as a value iteration, in every iteration of value iteration, will get you closer and closer to V star. Nobody's J value would reduce once you start from, so again, you know, the word value should not be used, the word cost should be used, okay? So, optimal cost of every node is the optimal cost path from there to the goal node. Okay, if I were to update it from a lower bound with, with every state with a lower bound heuristic, then I do value iteration, then every state's J value can only keep increasing. It will never reduce locally to start increasing again, which happens in normal MDPs. Right, in fact, in the textbook, they actually show pictures um, of uh, value iterations uh, uh, convergence where a whole bunch of states reduce their value only to start increasing it. Remember that because uh, the message hasn't passed from the, the you know, basically the, every value iteration looks around the neighbors and if the neighbors are worse than what you thought they were supposed to be, then you say, you know, this is what the real estate they say, if your you know, neighbors are not keeping their yards clean, um, then your uh, home value reduces. And somebody actually, Dave Barry says that Americans can tolerate pretty much any kind of neighbor, you know, including child killers, but not neighbors who don't um, mow their lawn. Because if you don't mow your lawn, then my property value reduces. And because people look around you know, my house and say, yeah, this guy's house is good, but all the other houses are bad, and so everybody glares at each other. That's why you have housing societies and all this fun stuff. But the point is a dynamic, a Bellman update looks around your you know, neighborhood and say, hey, you thought your house was good, okay? But yesterday there was a fire sale in the next house because they just sold it very cheap. So you should revise your house's value, okay? How many, I mean, there is, there's this site called Zillow.com which basically gives the current evaluation valuation for your house. And they keep updating it based on anytime somebody in the neighborhood sells a house, then the message sort of dynamic update, you know, Bellman update wise propagates to every house in that neighborhood. If anybody sells it above the value, then everybody's thing improves slightly. If everybody, anybody sells it below the value, everybody's falls down. Okay. Now the interesting thing is in the normal value functions, if you set the value function to be all zeros, okay, then you might be thinking, I have no good neighbors and I keep getting depressed for a bunch of time. 
before the neighbors around the high value goal state get the message and pass it along to the rest of the neighbors so that you'll reach you'll realize that hey you know you know you look around and you say i'm in a dump you know all my neighbors are none of my neighbors are mowing the lawn but then slowly you will realize that there is tempe town lake just two blocks down you haven't looked around that far and if you are two blocks down from tempe town lake then suddenly the fact that you are in the middle of a dump doesn't mean anything you are house value increases i mean i have a neighbor actually across from my home who used to have a run down um, uh, you know warehouse on the town lake side and uh, at the very height of the very height of the uh, real estate bubble in the summer of 2008 somebody bought that off of him for 10 million dollars and then promptly went bankrupt himself except my neighbor now has a ferrari so every day i get to see a ferrari you know from outside um so the the point of course is even though it's it's a warehouse with nothing around it but you know a couple of blocks down or like a block away from it was this you know lake and the message comes and your value improves okay initializing the value with a zero would make you sometimes reduce your value before you get start improving okay whereas initializing it with a good heuristic make sure that you just consistently become better and better estimate that's what a, a consistent heuristic which is a lower bound would do for stochastic shortest path okay um so what's real time dynamic programming um very simple think of this as providing a particular way of doing prioritized sweeping remember prioritized sweeping is decide on a schedule in which the state the values of a state are updated the normal synchronous iteration everyone is updated in first iteration then everyone is updated for the second iteration then everyone is updated for third iteration the moment you stop being synchronous then you have to ask okay if you don't want me to be synchronous then exactly who is the favorite who is not the favorite right somehow you have to say these are important states how do you decide some of them what is an important state the heuristic would tell you furthermore even if the heuristic is bad to begin with so think of it this way suppose i up um, i started my mdp again when i say mdp in this rest of this discussion i mean stochastic shortest path mdp i started it off with a lower bound h h value a good lower bound h value and then now um so in fact let me see so this by the way is a stochastic shortest path mdp it used to be something different when it had plus 1 here and minus 1 here so i just doctored it the minus one is gone the plus one is gone it's just zero and i basically the actions of going up and down have the same stochasticity i mean that means they can go they go in the intended direction only 80% of the time and go perpendicular directions you know 10% each of the time okay so stochastic shortest path is finding what should be the action to do and, and i'm starting from here and i want to find out what should be the action to do in the states in these states such that i'll reach that goal state okay that's what i'm trying to find out optimal actions okay um so suppose if i put everything to be zeros in the beginning as the value function you do know that if i tell you the j star for everything then you know what the optimal action is for each state optimal action is the greedy action right if i put zeros then you know the value function you have is the value function you know right so you essentially try to follow that value function and find the greedy action with respect to this value function now if everything is zero then essentially every direction looks just as good as every other direction so you just break ties arbitrarily so pretty much any arbitrary action would be the optimal action if i gave you slightly reasonable heuristic a slightly reasonable heuristic which is sort of related to for example remember where do heuristics come from where do heuristics come from for a problem relaxation relaxations you relax okay what can you relax in this problem you can relax of course when you used to relax all sorts of things in in you know tile world for example that tiles can jump over each other and reach wherever they want to go okay that's what just a deterministic problem here now on top of it you have stochastic action so one thing you can relax is 
probabilistic, the, the stochasticity. Okay, suppose I did that. Suppose I somehow converted these actions into deterministic actions. That's a relaxation of the problem. You know, in the back of your head, you start thinking now, and we'll answer it in a minute, as to which would be the right way to convert this action to a deterministic action, such that it will still be admissible. Okay, but suppose I were to do that. Okay, um, suppose I were to convert into a deterministic action, then I have a deterministic pathfinding problem. So I call my uncle Dijkstra and he would find me the shortest path from every state to the goal state. I will put those numbers as the initial j value. Now what happens? This start state now is for surrounded by differentiated neighbors. Not every neighbor is looking exactly equal. Okay? They may be wrongly differentiated if your heuristic is bad, but they hopefully are rightly differentiated if the heuristic is good. Okay, now I can actually ask myself, given my value function, what would be my best action? So do the greedy action. Okay? So as soon as I do the greedy action, now that greedy action, let's say, um, is to go uh, this way. Then I know that stochastically I can either reach this state or stay in this state. So now I update my values of those states. So basically, the, the order in which the update the values of the states is the order in which I visit them using my greedy policy. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, now updating actually makes you realize that, so for example, if everything was zero and somehow doing random actions you got up to here. And with some luck, you, for example, did this action, with which, with one, you know, with high probability, got you into zero, pro, you know, zero terminating state. Suddenly, now you know that your value is better than what you thought it was before. I mean, you, your cast has a better update now than what you thought it was before, because you are close to the goal now. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, and then that information can be passed back. Okay. So this is real-time dynamic programming. So you essentially do, so the original idea of real-time dynamic programming is actually was done in the context of reinforcement learning, okay, where you don't know the probabilities and you don't know the rewards either. Okay. And so you are in an unknown world, all you know is the actions that you can do. Based on your memory, you have some idea of how good different states surrounding you are. Based on that, you do the best action you think is a reasonable action. Now that action which did a good thing last time does a bad thing this time because it also has multiple outcomes and the good one happened last time. That's why you thought that was a good thing to do. This time it did the bad thing. Okay, then you get to a new state based on that action. And then you will be able to update now the valuation of this state based on the fact that it also has some bad neighbors, which I didn't know before. Okay, so real time, Trial, RTDP trials were used originally to support reinforcement learning. But in our case, actually, we don't need to do the execution in the world. We just need to simulate the execution in our model. The difference is that if, in fact, when you execute this action of try to carefully walk on the, walk on the, um, the, the rim of Grand Canyon, last time around I was able to walk on it and then get to a very nice sunset spot. This time, with some probability, I fell down, right? That's it. I don't get to do any more, oh, I made a mistake. I don't get to do that. I'm dead now, okay? Some, then some, the society as a whole learns a better value function because Arizona Republic would say, another silly guy tried to do this on the rim and so people should not be doing this, okay? But you, for your own life, it's end. Whereas if you are simulating in your head, it's not the end. You can realize that, hey, you know, I could have fallen off with a pretty high probability. So let me not do it unless I like to fall. Okay? And so RTDP being applied to a full model scenario, which in the, in the beginning looks weird because it's an idea that was developed to deal with worlds whose models are not available to you. But then whether the we are using it to deal with worlds whose model is available, but we are too lazy to use them directly. 
you want to use them on demand driven fashion. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Um, if uh, that's basically what RDP does, and uh, uh, and then if you start the RDP off with a reasonable heuristic, start it with a reasonable heuristic, then every trial will be with respect to the current value function. So remember, in the very beginning, everybody has you know J0s. Then they do a trial. As soon as you do a trial, you are visiting some states. Every state you visit, you update its value because you now know its actual neighbors with respect to the greedy action. So you update its value. So as soon as that changes in some sense, it's no longer J0, it's now J1. Because at least one state has a different value function. So now when you compute the greedy policy, it will be slightly different for the states. Okay? And so you are all the time trying to compute the greedy policies and do the action as specified by the greedy policy for that particular state. And you are enjoying the work. Okay? And you are updating those states that you are actually going through. The advantage of this is exactly what I was telling you last class, that if I need to go to San Francisco and I believe that most, like, most of the time I don't fall off the sky into uh, Mojave Desert, it's more important for me to know what to do when I find myself in the taxi stand and less important for me to know what to do when I fall off in Mojave Desert because the probability that I'll fall off in Mojave Desert is much lower. Probability that I will be in my taxi stand you know, is much higher. So I need to know that. And I will know this because essentially if I start with a reasonable heuristic then the greedy trials will more likely put me through the states that I'm actually going to encounter. So, you know, sometimes when we taxi stand, there's no taxis, then you go stand in front of the shuttle uh, stand. So, those two are still likely. Whereas, none of your greedy trials would make you stand in the middle of, um, in the middle of Mojave Desert. It's a very less likely event. So, you need to do a large number of, you know, trials to find one Mojave Desert happen. Okay, and so Mojave Desert part, you don't get to actually update its value too often. Okay, so this one has the advantages that you want for prioritized sweeping. You are going to get the right values for the states that you would see. And they will converge to their optimal values much faster. And the guys who you don't see, they will converge slower. You don't see often, they will converge slower. So given the same amount of time, this will get you the policy, the partial policy that actually matters as against, you know, partial, the right things to do in areas that you don't actually get. Okay, so um, here is a picture, if that if picture helps. So, um, so basically, if I have a state as zero, I can do actually A1, A2, A3, and then, in fact, that will get me to various states. Okay, and if I'm doing real Bellman update, real Bellman update, what I need to do is I need to compute the maximum expected value for these based on these J values, this guy based on those J values, this guy based on those J values, and then pick the one which is the winner. And then add that to the reward of the state, and that will become the next value for a zero. That's what you do. But you will find, by the way, that in some sense, doing a Bellman update is a very costly operation. I mean, it's less costly than doing planning, but it's too costly because Bellman update says, I'm in this state, consider all the actions I can do. Consider all the possible states I can get into because of each of those actions. Figure out which is the best action. In any realistic world, there are way too many things you can do and way too few things that are actually worth doing given where you need to get to. Okay, so you need to avoid doing Bellman update. Okay, and RTDP allows you to avoid doing Bellman update. It takes a lazy feel for this. What the lazy thing is, essentially, it will say, okay, um, instead of looking at this way, I would, oh, okay, so, you know, this is basically what I was saying is find the minimum of these actions. If it's a SSSP, you take the minimum cost of minimum expected cost action and then take that cost, add it to the reward, and you will get one value iteration. 
instead of doing this, I'm going to do it this way. I pick the action A2 because based on the current J values, action A2 is the greedy action, greedy best action for my state. I just pick that. And that action A2 will actually give three possible outcomes. I wouldn't even do all three possible outcomes. I will actually toss a coin. <laughs> right? This is, you know, you go from Bellman update, you, you'll see this hopefully in the reinforcement learning. Bellman update is the most eager learner. You know, I just want to learn. It's not just about grades anymore. It's just want to learn. You know, tell me more, tell me more, is what Bellman update is doing. Okay. This guy is at least somewhat interested learner because they're at least saying if I were to do this action, the following three things can happen. Let me at least evaluate what the outcome for this action is. But the, the laziest guys, and some of you are those because you came to the class without actually completing the review, hoping that the coin toss would be such that Rao would be in a good mood and I don't have to flunk the class. Right? Okay. And it worked in this case. So hopefully you learned the wrong lesson that, you know, depend on Rao's generosity. But um, so what happens in this case is that you essentially uh, toss the coin and then one of these outcomes actually happens. Now remember that, remember that if you are really a kid, if you are a kid and you don't know how the world works, you didn't actually know that when you did this action these three states will occur. So for a kid, this is not definitely feasible because they don't know what are all the things they can do and what all will happen. They don't also know that if they were to pick a specific action, exactly what things will happen. What they really do is they get to pick the action and then nature tosses the coin. And one of the outcomes will actually be experienced by the kid. And you are not kids, you are graduate students. But sometimes, you know, instead of thinking, you would want to sample the world because it turns out it actually sometimes is actually competition advantage. Okay, so you sampled this and it turned out that let's say the sampling said this is the state that happened. So then from this state, I pick the greedy action that's supposed to happen. From again, given the J values. And then I that, I'll do that using again a tossing. The interesting thing is the only way the model is actually coming into the picture is the model knows the prior probabilities. The, the guy who's, you know, your, there's a part of your program which knows the probabilities for these three outcomes. So let's say this is point 0.1, this is point 0.3, and this is point 0.6. So then it finds a random number between 0 and 1. If that number is more than 0.6, I'm saying if the number is more than 0.1, it'll do this, more than 0.4, it'll do this, more than anywhere else, it'll do that. 0.6, it'll do this. So those are the ways you can essentially say multi-faced multi-faced um, point us. Yes, sir? So the kid is essentially learning what this probability distribution is. In, if you are actually if you are actually learning in the world, and this, this picture will show again in the reinforcement learning, and the, when you are in an unknown world, essentially you get to learn the transition probability model. What is interesting actually, since you brought this up, and very interesting question that we will again come to in reinforcement learning, is should the kid figure out how the world works, which is the model of the world, and what the what model of the world basically says is, if you were to do this action with this probability, you'll go to this state. With this probability, you'll go to this state. With this probability, you'll go to this state. Should he should he or she learn those probabilities, or should he or she just learn what's the right action for each state? And it turns out that instead of learning. So if you do know the probabilities, D, uh, if you know the probabilities D of S, A, S dash, then you can multiply with uh, V star of S dash, sum it over, you will get the maximum expected, the expected value for doing action A. But another way is, it turns out that there is a different function, I think I mentioned it, in the class once and we'll be mentioning it in a, in a bit again. So let me say, you something called Q values. Okay, a Q value is defined as Q of S A. Okay, that means the Q value of doing action A in state S. That's actually 
turns out is sum of t s a s dash v star s dash. Okay, now the kid who is working in the world doesn't need to know this math because they will feel this. They will essentially get an approximation to the q value directly. And if you learn q values directly, that is called model free. RL. And if you learn the probabilities and then compute the q values indirectly, then it's called model based RL. Now the interesting thing is, if you have q values, v star is still defined because v star of s is nothing but but arg max. I'm sorry, is nothing but max of the q of s a for all over all a's, right? So it turns out that you can do everything in MDP is just thinking in terms of Q's which sort of package the probability and the value together. How many of you have heard Q learning in reinforcement learning? Some of you may have heard it. That's what Q learning basically does. Okay. A model based learning will actually learn the probabilities. Okay. Now we are doing this whole thing in a very cynical way because we actually know everything. We know the T's. We know, we know the probabilities already. Okay? It's just we don't want to use it. You know, we want to say rather than think and kill yourself, you want to kind of let, let's go with the flow. This is the go with the flow mentality, you know, where we do have a brain, but we want to see how the flow will take us so that, you know, the brain will be cool. Okay? Brain will be cool, his computer will be cool, so it doesn't spend too much time. That's exactly what we're doing here. And, you know, I'm sort of saying it actually is positive. And, you know, the fact that you are doing it, you know, we are all intelligent people, you know, we do some of these things because they have expected advantages, you know. You could have killed yourself not sleeping yesterday night and writing the, um, the, the, the review, you know. Or you could have said, you know, let's assume that the probability that Rav is like a softy is quite high and go to sleep. And, you know, you know exactly what you guys did, right. And you worked out well. And um, so, Sometimes that's basically what RTDP is essentially going to do. So it's got one trial now, and every state on the trial, its value will be updated. Okay? It's updated basically as the. So if currently each state has a J value, now you take the Q value of this action that you just did and then update it using the Q value of the action, okay? And so here is basically greedy on policy RTDP. This paper, you'll read it, you know, with, with my sort of the overview. Um, so it's essentially doing a trial until each trial ends when the last state is a goal state. So you keep doing the greedy action, tossing a coin, doing the greedy action, tossing a coin until you reach the goal state. When you reach, and as you are doing it, on the way, you are updating the state's value function. Okay? And so in each state, you do the greedy action for that state. You pick the greedy action for that state. Then you update the, now that you pick this as the action for that state, you actually recompute what would be the real value for this state. Just like in the policy iteration. Now that I know this is the action I am doing, what should be my value? Okay? So updating essentially is here. Uh, if A is the greedy action, then the value of the state is nothing but the Q value of that action. And the Q value of the action, you have all the information in front of you because this action A will, with probability 0.6 take you to S1, probability 0.3 take you to S2, probability 0.1 take you to S3. And S1, S2, S3, I already know the current J values. So expected summation of that is the Q value for this action. I'll just say the value of my state is really the Q value. Okay? So I did that and then now I'm going to do stochastically simulate the next state. So now that this action is done, you know, only one of those states will really happen. So I'll simulate by tossing the coin. I'll get a state. That's what the uh, simulate somewhere 
I mean, it doesn't, you don't need to write it, I guess. S pick next state using the probabilities with respect to the action A, and, uh, and, and then continue. Okay, and when you reach the goal state, you come back again and do one more RTPTP trial. This way, some, go, some states which are likely to be on the path, which are likely to be on the uh, path to the, the goal state uh, in the optimal policy will be updated more often. Okay? And it's actually a much cheap, it's a quite a cheap algorithm to write because each piece of the algorithm essentially is just not doing, you know, per node cost of this algorithm is very low. You're not even doing a full Bellman update. Okay? So what are the advantages of this? The properties are that if all states are visited infinitely often, if all states are visited infinitely often, then J, the, the Jn will be, that is the nth time value function will be J star. Because that's a convergence property. Um, and then only the relevant states will be considered because for you to update the state's value, that state should have appeared in the greedy path with respect to a greedy policy that you are following with respect to the current value function. If you started with a sort of reasonable value function, very unlikely states would not would have very low probabilities of actually even coming through in the simulation phase. So I would barely ever reach Mojave Desert in my simulation. So I would not find the value or the cost of Mojave Desert and so I would not find the right action for that either. Okay. Okay. Um, so the advantage is so that a state is relevant if the optimal policy could visit it. That's a very interesting thing. So a state is only relevant if the optimal policy could visit it. If the optimal policy won't visit it, the fact that the state is connected doesn't mean a thing. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, this is how we live in the world. I mean, you know, we are walking near Grand Canyon. You know, there is, for random people, there are non-zero probability of falling into the Grand Canyon. And yet we all go without being worried about falling into the Grand Canyon because we are MDPs. We get to choose our actions. Okay? While actions are stochastic, there is very few actions you can do close to the visitor center which have a stochastic outcome of you falling into the Grand Canyon, especially because, how many of you have been to Grand Canyon recently? Okay, um, you should go by the way, you're in Arizona. Um, and um, they, the, the, the visitor center is like way far away from the rim. Okay, and they built this huge big visitor center. They don't want any stochastic outcome to make you fall into the, you know, uh, Grand Canyon. And also they will write, you know, I don't remember when I first went to Grand Canyon when I came to ASU back in 90s, 91 or sometime. And then more recently when I keep going, it's like they have gotten, I guess, sued too many times <laughs> by people or something. So they have all these things like, are you crazy to come here? Did you realize that you can fall into the canyon? Don't even go near the canyon. With these big, big, you know, advertisements. And if you read all of them, you'll get really depressed, stay inside the car, close the windows and come back. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they take, they're making sure that you would not do any action which has any probability of falling into the canyon, okay? And you, in a sense, even though you are next to the canyon, it just doesn't mean that you will fall into the canyon. If you don't do the actions that will take you to the edge of the canyon, you won't fall into the canyon, okay? So if your optimal policy will involve actually staying alive and doing the midterm and final for various courses, then essentially it will not allow you to go through, you know, lower parts of Grand Canyon. And so you don't need to know in your RTDP trials, you'll never ever reach that part, even during simulation, and so they are not relevant. They are not relevant, and you would not find what's the right thing to do there. It's kind of a good thing, okay? So the advantage is, it's any time more probable states get explored quickly. The disadvantage is, is complete convergence is slow because there may be there may be states which are like borderline relevant. They are like 10 power minus 7 or 10 power minus 8 probability that you will find yourself in that state. Should you know what to do there? 
Well, um, you know, my best example is uh, think of Captain Salan Badger. Who is uh, Captain Salan Badger? See the guy that landed the Exactly. How often do you learn? If you are a pilot, <laughs> how often do you learn? What are you supposed to do when right after you take off from LaGuardia Airport, the birds will get into your engine and you are supposed to fly this 757 or 747 like a bird and slowly you know, land on the Hudson. Okay? With pretty much every other pilot in the world, <laughs> right, those guys would have been dead. And we wouldn't even have felt sorry for them because they say, hey, you know, I mean, these pilots are being reasonable. I mean, you guys were taking more chances that I would have a soft heart. The pilots were taking less chances that the birds would have not, would not have the amount of thinking required to fall into both engines at the same time that the plane dies. Right? The probability of that happening is so low. Why should I worry as to what to do then? I have better things to do, such as you know, having a good weekend. You know, and, and this guy, for some weird reason, apparently figured out what to do then. Okay, that's why you know, those people survive. So, I mean, to me, as to whether or not complete convergence is important, you should ask yourself, is Captain Salvador important? If you think, yeah, it's okay, I mean, you know, if he's on CNN for a couple of days, and I'm sure I don't need to be on CNN. And also, there are better ways of getting onto CNN, you know, just go out and shoot a couple of people, you'll be on CNN much faster. Saving people doesn't seem to get you anywhere. But the important thing is that the convergence, the fact that you know most pilots will do RTDP, the flight simulators, they use flight simulators, right? How often do flight simulators simulate the unlikely events? If they're actually, if they're actually um, faithful to the probability, uh, with the to the probabilities in the model, they should probably never ever show uh, you know falling into the Hudson aspect of the flight, right? And so they did RTDP, they learned how to fly well, most of the time they'll be fine, but you know, this one time they'll die. Okay, so, um, so the, the reason this is interesting is that RTDP as a whole is a great idea, but it has this convergence problem. Because the less likely states, when they happen, you don't know what to do. Okay, and what's interesting of course, is that a probability of a less likely state and the utility of that state are completely different. They are orthogonal. I can play which the, such that you know, people get to write these black swan kind of books. The point is some unexpected event of very low probability can happen and wipe out all your stock market savings. I mean, you shouldn't call it savings in stock market to begin with, but you know, whatever your stock market value is. Okay? And so the the eventuality is low probability, but the downside is pretty much unlimited. Okay, and so, to, yes, second. So, to the extent that matters, to the extent there is this very high variation in the values, I mean, the rewards, the immediate rewards of the states, you do care about convergence, not just knowing what's the right thing to do. And the everybody should converge. Yes, sir. If suppose you have multiple of those crazy states, such as falling in. Desert and the plane spontaneously exploding and stuff like that. To some extent, since the probabilities are so low, they're irrelevant to the planning problem. So, could you kind of collapse them into like a sink state? So, that's basically called. So, that's. So, there are. You know, I also mentioned that there's a 90 page paper I suggested to you guys, right? Boutillier, Hanks, and Dean, which is. Um, decision theoretic planning, structural assumptions and computational leverage. And they talk about like tons of these kinds of ideas for handling MDPs. For example, one of the things is you do abstraction over states and say all these states are bad. You know, why, you know, why essentially split hairs between this is minus infinity bad, this is minus infinity bad, too bad. They're all bad. Okay, and then I'll put them all together into an equivalence class of big bad side. And then anybody who goes into any of those states is now going into the super state. And then that reduces the size of the MDP now. And then you can find the optimal policy for that. The interesting question would be, can you say anything about the quality of that policy versus the quality of the original policy?
okay we may not actually get to much of it here but decomposition methods abstraction methods they're all very important but it's not surprising you did this in deterministic search too to some extent okay okay so it turns out that the reason in fact the rtdp idea came for long back actually uh, and the one that you want to read is lrtdp because all they added on top of rtdp is to actually to change this and say that all there is actual bound an actual theoretical bound on how many you know lrtdp trials are needed before in fact jn becomes j star and to be able to provide that to be able to provide that they need to um, deal with convergence because remember the way we define the distance between the value functions is max norm so if you screw up on one state's value really badly do you understand what i say so so in some sense it's not so much that i don't know what happens if i fall into um, you know mohave desert i will give some default value for it whatever the h0 the, the initial heuristic gave is just that the initial heuristic may be way too optimistic and i can do much worse really if i only took time to realize how bad things can get and so you should have taken steps to not get there or if you do go there then you need to know what the real values are okay uh um, so to be able to actually consider uh, to put a bound you need to be able to make sure that if all states converge that's how you can put a bound and to convergence essentially um all you do is basically the, the lrtdp again you are going to read this paper and we'll discuss it again read it um you start with a, a lower bound a monotonic heuristic and uh, and so then every iteration makes jn monotonically increase towards j star it never reduce so there is no locally suddenly looking optimal only to become more pessimistic because you have a monotonic lower bound heuristic okay that much is not hard to understand that's basically also true in rtdp normal rtdp the other thing they do is they will keep track of which states have converged in the past what used to happen in the normal rtd lrtdp what happens is a trial has to go all the way to a terminating state because in some sense the reason you get to the goal state is because that's the only one we know has converged because goal state is a sink state sink states immediate reward is the same as its optimal value so that's the only one you know happen to have converged but suppose i kept track of other states which also converged to their correct value after a while then what happens essentially is a i have more states which are converged so when i do a new um uh, new trial i can end with any of those states and update i don't need to reach all the way to the goal state and secondly the secondly the and this is the kind of the more interesting part you can actually uh, you can actually propagate the solved labeling okay if your state is solved and uh, then you know if, if the entire neighborhood of a state is solved then that state is solved i'm sorry if, yeah solved basically means converge if the entire neighborhood of a state already reached its optimal values then this state has reached its optimal value too because it's they're not going to change so this guy is not going to change anything okay and you then start propagating the solved labels and that's an interesting part actually you should you know understand there is easy cases so for example um in this case uh s can go to g and uh, all these are higher q cas and the one that it would do greedily will get it to g and g already is solved it's converged and so s essentially is converged you know its correct value this is easy to understand you know you should read the paper to understand that there are more complex cases where a set of converged nodes together make another node another state converge okay and if you pass this if you um, propagate these convergence labels the solved labels then in essence not only 
is RTDP going to be fast, but it's also going to converge fast. Okay, and um, so basically what they'll show is even normal RTDPs uh, in these pictures, I don't know which is which, but so this is LRTDP and this is RTDP. Unfortunately, you can't tell which is which. Um, you will notice that the RTDP would be correct for all the likely states very fast. But then, and then the policy loss becomes a small value, but it will keep reducing much slowly until it becomes epsilon. Okay. By the way, whenever I talked about convergence, I mean, sorry. whenever I talk about convergence, what I mean is not so much that it has the optimal value because you don't, you know, you don't stop up to that, but it's within epsilon of its optimal value. Okay, and to be able to do this, essentially, you talk about the Bellman residual. Okay, and Bellman residual was there in this case too. The residual of a Bellman, uh, the Bellman residual is the current value of S minus the Q value of A. Right, so current S, S currently already has a value. Now you decided to do greedy action A in it, and it has a Q value. If that Q value is the same as the SS current value, that means the value function hasn't changed. If they are very close, then the absolute difference is the threshold by which this particular state is away from its optimal value. Okay, and so you essentially keep track of these uh, the the residuals in propagating the solved labels. Okay. Uh, so the interesting thing is that the bigger issue is RTDP, the smaller issue is the convergence of RTDP. Practically, convergence is not important. Practically, pilots don't learn what to do when you know both their engines get cut off. Okay. Um, but if you are interested in making theoretical bounds, then you know convergence is important. And, and that's why it's an interesting algorithm. Okay. And uh, so we'll stop here, next class actually, one of the things you can, once you understand LRTDP, I said you have to start with, by initializing, start by initializing the value function to some, I mean, the, the, the J function to some heuristic. The question is which heuristic? And in fact, let me um, mess with your head as you leave, and, and then we'll stop there. So here I said, I can make this action deterministic, right? Now look at this action. If you were to make this deterministic, what would you do? One very reasonable thing to do is take the most likely outcome. That means this will just do this. That's a way of making it deterministic. Suppose I did that. Suppose I did that. Would the heuristic that I get, would it be admissible? No, no, I only care about admissibility. Suppose I determine, so I basically, so this is, this is the notion of determinizations that people who read FF half have already heard of, okay? So what I'm talking about is most likely outcome determinization. So make each action be determinized to its most likely outcome. That's the most likely outcome determinization. That's the most reasonable thing you would think of. The problem is, if you do that, then this will never happen. That means this state and this state will never happen at all for that action. So because of which, suppose I were to make, suppose I want to make, um, you now I can make a, a scenario where uh, the only way this action can reach the goal state is to essentially try hitting itself on head like this and hope that it will go the up arc. Do you understand what I'm saying? So suppose, you know, I remove I remove the going up action from the domain. There is still a way, starting from here, you can reach there. You know, suppose I only have this action in this state. I can keep hitting myself on the wall, and with some probability I will get here. And when I get here, then I do my right thing. Now, if I took this action and removed these less likely outcomes, then I would say with that deterministic action, the cost of going to the state, goal state is infinity because I can't reach in full state. 
infinity means the heuristic has overestimated the true cost. That means the heuristic is not a lower bound. So most likely outcome determination will not be a lower bound heuristic. Okay, another idea would be to say, well, everything will happen. I mean, it's kind of text description here because exactly how do you get into all three states. But I'll just assume that when I do this action, I am already present in all those three states. Will this be a lower bound? That basically is the all outcomes determination. That will be a lower bound. It would be having the problem you are talking about. It will be a lower bound, but it will be useless because it will think the less likely as well as the more likely outcomes are just equally likely. Okay, so we will talk more about these ideas of determination as the basis for heuristics when we come next class. And you would have read FF half and LRTDP by then, definitely.